Michael Binion, in your 50 years at the Times, you've covered and written about many a coup. How does Niger compare, do you think? Well, it's a classic African pattern, and I'm afraid uh, just nearby uh, we see the, the, the prime example of coups, which is Nigeria, which is potentially a very rich, prosperous country, which has basically been held back for years by endless attempts to manoeuvre and oust the government. They've had five successful coups, military coups, three unsuccessful ones. They've had a military government for 33 years, between 66 and 99, uh, and uh, we're only now entering into a period of relative stability uh, and uh, peaceful democratic government. But um, some of the coups have been very bloody. Some have led to the uh, instalment of people who were frankly dreadful dictators. Sani Abacha was probably the worst and the last one. Uh, and uh, Nigeria is one of many countries in the region. But I've also seen coups elsewhere. I suppose the most spectacular one, one I covered uh, partly, uh, was one that didn't uh, go well at all, which was the attempt to oust Gorbachev. Well, we'll speak about that in just a moment. I really look forward to your memories of that. But Moita, you've picked out three of the coups that have had the biggest impact on world history, in your view. Let's start in Czechoslovakia in February 1948. A series of carefully plotted communist moves throughout the Republic, Gottwald marshaled his strength to force the resignation of anti-communists from the government. With characteristic party discipline, his orders were followed in detail by communist action committees. And to demonstrate his strength and purposes, his henchmen threatened a nationwide token strike. Uh, talk us through this one, Moita. So what happened here was uh, the Soviet-backed uh, Czechoslovak Communist Party um, took over power. And this was a time, uh, as, as some of us may recall, um, was the early phase of the Cold War, and the U.S. Uh, was considering how to go about dealing with the Soviet Union, how to go about uh, rebuilding Europe. And so this uh, coup happens in Czechoslovakia, and we see in the U.S. Uh, an increased, uh, um, you could say, support for the Marshall Plan, the, the plan to aid the recovery of Europe. Because at the time, uh, prior to this coup, uh, some in, in the U.S. Congress were a bit hesitant as to whether this amount of money should go to aid Europe or not. But then the coup happens and the tensions between the U.S. and the Soviet Union are heightened and there's this increased support for, for the Marshall Plan. At the same time, I think that those who could link uh, the, the Czechoslovakia coup uh, with increased support and increases of to establish NATO, which we see being established uh, in 1949, a year after uh, this February 1948 coup. And why was this such a significant moment in the history of, uh, of post-war Europe, Michael? Well, because it, it showed that the Soviet Union had total dominance over uh, all Eastern Europe, all the places they had uh, liberated from Nazi Germany, but uh, where they remained with their forces. And it was simply implementing Stalin's view that there should be total Soviet control and a buffer zone over uh, the Soviet Union's neighbours. So the whole of the Warsaw Pact, as it then became, was communist. And in fact, it then was clear that no country, having become communist, would be allowed to revert from from that state. So when uh, Czechoslovakia, for example, tried to escape the clutches of the Soviet Union in 1968, uh, there was a, uh, an invasion, uh, same as happened in Hungary in 1956, and all Eastern Europe was essentially uh, part of the Soviet Empire. Very, very interesting and consequential indeed. Uh, let's fast forward a couple of decades and head to Portugal in April 1974. Uh, Moita, what are the key differences here? I mean, the key difference here would be um, the, you could say, the consequence of the Czechoslovakia coup and the consequences of the Portugal coup in '74. Because in, in the Czechoslovak case, we see that um, the coup happens and um, authoritarian rule comes to dominate uh, Czechoslovakia until uh, uh, almost the end of the Cold War. But then in Portugal, we see this coup actually uh, taking out uh, the authoritarian regime and, re, uh, and ushering in uh, Portugal's transition to democracy. But at the same time, there are other features that you could say distinguish this coup from the Portugal coup from uh, the Czechoslovakia coup, because in the case of Portugal, we see a coup taking place within this broader context of um, decolonization in, in, in 
Africa and Southeast Asia, and the implications of that coup uh, when it comes to what happens to uh, Portugal's uh, former colonies, uh, Mozambique and Mozambique. Angola. Mozambique, yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. And then it has huge ramifications in Africa as well as in Portugal itself. Exactly, exactly. So what happens is the coup happens uh, in Portugal. Uh, the, the new regime in Portugal decides to um, leave Mozambique and Angola and, and the other uh, Portuguese colonies. Uh, and in Mozambique and Angola, particularly, we see this power struggle that emerges in these two countries, uh, resulting in civil wars. Civil wars that end up uh, attracting interventions from the US, the Soviet Union, Cuba, and, and South Africa. And so you, you have you know, civil wars uh, resulting from uh, what happened in Portugal, attracting all these actors, uh, all these key actors during the Cold mm. War. And it's in, you know, Michael, this was such a moment in the history of Western Europe. You know, Salazar had been in power from 1932, 1968, such a dominant figure and his authoritarian regime. Obviously, he's he's out of office because of um, he's incapacitated by, incapacitated by a stroke by 1968. But this, you know, is such a huge moment, such a watershed moment for Europe. It was wonderful. I was there. I reported it. I remember they overthrew Caetano. Uh, and it was led by an extremely unlikely uh, coup leader, General Spinola, who was a monocle general of the old school, but he just realised that fighting the colonial wars in Mozambique and Angola forever and ever was never going to work and that Portuguese uh, forces were being drained. Uh, he, he took the decision to get rid of the uh, fascist government, as it then was, uh, and it was a good coup. Um, people were rejoicing in the streets. It was also bloodless. Mm. There was almost nobody killed, certainly not within Portugal. Um, there were soldiers uh, with carnations in their rifles. They called it the Carnation Revolution. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a summer of... Yeah, it was it was a summer of chaos and nobody quite knew what was happening. And the communists tried to take advantage of that to uh, turn Portugal into a communist state. And there was a slightly precarious moment where the Communist Party of Portugal was making a key effort to dominate the political scene. But the Americans took a fairly firm line on that. And then it, it moved into a more democratic phase. And luckily, that coup, the, the good coup, as it were, was never reversed. Democracy took hold. It's very interesting. You know, and it's not always an easy transition from a forceful taking of power to a stable democracy thereafter, is it? No, very often it goes completely wrong. You often get either a counter-coup or you get people in charge who say, oh, yes, yes, we're going to move to democracy, and they never do. And uh, we've seen that, for example, in Sudan, mm. uh, where they got rid of uh, uh, Bashir, a nasty uh, tyrant, uh, and uh, the military junta that took power uh, said they were going to open it up to democracy. There was a brief period when they did. But they haven't. And in fact, what's happened is now we've got a civil war in Sudan as various uh, rival military factions are, are vying for power. Well, let's talk about some more surprising coups. Mawita, you picked out the Zimbabwean coup against Robert Mugabe in November 2017. Remind us of what happened there. So what happens here is uh, Robert Mugabe uh, had been in power since 1980. Uh, and uh, as many of us uh, uh, may be aware, in the beginning, people thought this individual was truly committed to democracy. But then, as it turned out, this wasn't the case. And so what happens as he gets older is uh, Mugabe begins to think about who would replace him. Mm. And so there was uh, a faction within the, the ruling ZAN-PF, the, the Zimbabwean uh, African National Union Party, that supported Mugabe's wife, uh, Grace Mugabe, to take over power. Whereas there was another faction that actually was in favor of someone else. Um, one of these other persons happened to be uh, uh, Mugabe's deputy, Emerson Mnagagwa, the current vice president. Oh, sorry, the current president. Uh, at the time, he's vice president. Um, and Mugabe, for whatever reason, decides to fire uh, Mnagagwa. Um, and within a week, uh, Mnagagwa's supporters within the armed forces staged this coup. Uh, and they went out of their way, um, if, if you followed the, the events at the time, they went out of their way to not label this a coup, right? to try and talk mm. about how this is uh, a replacement, Mugabe is resigning. In fact, they went, uh, um, they went to court and had one of the courts in Zimbabwe rule that Mugabe, uh, uh, the ousting of Mugabe was, was actually legal. So you have these events taking place that somehow are surprising because, I mean, no one was expecting Mugabe to uh, uh, having to have lost control of the narrative. Yeah, his control particular... of Zimbabwe had been so total for so long, and that's exactly. why it was such a surprising exactly. moment. Um, 
Michael, let's talk about another surprising cue, staying on the continent of Africa. What did Mark Thatcher, what did he go ah, to this was an extraordinary in one. Equatorial Guinea? Well, this was an extraordinary thing. In fact, it, it pretty well followed that novel, uh, The Dogs of War, which was about the overthrow of a government in a tiny, small West African country that at the time was impoverished, now turns out to be extremely rich. It was an attempt to overthrow the government of Equatorial Guinea, um, little tiny place, but uh, subsequently proved to have masses of oil. And Mark Thatcher uh, and various others were um, sponsoring uh, an armed attempt. I mean, I have to say the government in Equatorial Guinea was rotten to the core, so it was ripe for toppling. Uh, and in fact, when they did, um, there was a coup, but uh, it, it didn't work. Uh, and Mark Thatcher and various others uh, were arrested. Well, certainly some of his associates, I don't think he was arrested at the time, it was plotted in South Africa. And um, uh, uh, several of them went to prison. They, went, they were imprisoned in Equatorial Guinea, in not very nice circumstances at all. Uh, but the whole thing collapsed. Uh, and in the end, um, Equatorial Guinea, uh, they've got, I mean, they had their own government, but Thatcher was deeply embarrassed by his association with these plotters. And it just goes to show that often coups are driven from the outside by people with external interests in those countries. Can you just tell us briefly, Michael, before we take a short break, what it was like to be in, in Moscow in 1991 when, as you said earlier, Mikhail Gorbachev's, uh, the coup against Mikhail Gorbachev failed? Yes, I wasn't actually... In there, uh, I wasn't there at the time, but I had reported from outside. I'd been in Moscow for a long time before that. I subsequently returned after that, but I followed it very closely. And it was an extraordinary situation where um, the Soviet armed forces had always been utterly reliable and utterly subservient to the leadership. Gorbachev was on holiday in the Crimea, and a number of coup plotters, including the head of the uh, KGB, as it then was, uh, decided that he was uh, losing his grip and that the Soviet Union was in danger of breaking up because he he had promised various uh, independence or autonomy to some of the various republics. And he was sort of trapped in his in his villa down, uh, down on the Black Sea coast. Mm. Uh, and this lot took control, but they were utterly incompetent. They didn't know what they were doing. And the one person who stood up to them was Boris Yeltsin, who was at the time uh, party leader in Moscow. And he stood on top of a tank in, in the central Moscow and he rallied people around him. And in the end, the... the, the armed forces that they'd tried to send in to keep control of Moscow just sort of fizzled away. I mean, it just never happened. And then the, the plotters, after three days, they more or less uh, lost their nerve, and the whole thing was over. Gorbachev made a triumphant return to Moscow. Didn't last long, I'm afraid. He mm. was out of power within a few, well, within a few weeks, because Yeltsin was clearly the man of the moment. Interesting. Uh, you know, as you say, a lot... A lot hinges on how leaders respond in the moment, as uh, as Yeltsin and Gorbachev did there.